have the last couple weeks been like for you at the university? Oh, um, remarkable. Really, really remarkable. How, how would you describe um, just your reaction to, to the news starting back uh, before Thanksgiving, um, that meeting Monday morning? How, how would you describe that? Well, it was pretty surprising. Uh, I did not expect that. And uh, um, so I was, uh, I was pretty surprised. And the two fellows who came were pretty uncomfortable, and I wanted to make them feel as comfortable as I could. Um, how does it feel to have so much support from the community in your departure? Um, really humbling and amazing. Uh, that's been the biggest surprise of all. Why was that a surprise? You just never think that you would have that kind of impact on a community as, as, as big and as skeptical and as tough as a university community is. And it's moved Jan and I very deeply. Um, so uh, what are your plans uh, after you step down as president? Well, I'm... Still trying to get my head around the, the plans. Uh, we hadn't really planned anything at this stage in our careers beyond the University of Oregon presidency. So, I mean, the most immediate and obvious option is simply to elect to become a member of the tenured faculty of the university, which I am, and uh, teach uh, classical India and Sanskrit. Yeah, I'd heard, um, according to Uh, it probably wouldn't be until next fall, but um, as I said, I haven't even had time to sit down and think about that specific question. Um, why do you still want to be a part of this community? This is a wonderful place, um, and, and it's a great university, uh, much, much better than the world understands. And probably better than the state deserves given the level of investment in the this, in this state. And for me, uh, when I came here, people asked me what was the biggest surprise, you know, what, what, what have you found the most surprising, et cetera. What I found most surprising, most consistently surprising, is the quality of the faculty. It's superb, much better than, than compensation levels might lead you to believe. When you say uh, the university is better than the state uh, deserves, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Well, um, the University of Oregon receives less money per capita per student than any university in the state of Oregon. Um, even with all of the difficulties in California, uh, University of California system schools receive about $9,000 per student from the state. University of Oregon this year will probably go below $3,000 per student. Um, basically what Oregon has done is, is just completely step away from investing in public higher education, and particularly here at the University of Oregon. Um, we receive way less money, way less money per student than any other university in the state. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, it's a big difference. In fact, Phil, can you get can you get a, get that data f for them? <coughs> and um, over the long term, that's going to result in uh, in a in a poorer university than it needs to be. Um, so I understand that you have not um, completely mapped out where you will be uh, in the next couple terms or next year, but um, have you put any thought, or do you think you will put any thought into seeking other leadership positions at the university, if you were to say, um, perhaps through the university senate? Or at, 
at this university. Um, that's that seems fairly unlikely. Um, one of the obligations of a past president is to stay out of the way of the current president as much as possible. Um, what message do you think the uh, State Board of Higher Education sends to the University of Oregon by firing you? Um, well, I'm probably not the best, the best person to answer that at, at this point. Um, my sense is that that the message that people heard was that in the midst of the optimism and a sense that we had a plan, set of plans that could shift the decline of the university because the faculty are the ones who really, and the, and the staff are the ones who really feel this decline. Students come here and all they know is the four-year period while they're here. Faculty are here and see the erosion um, there was a sense of optimism that that might change and that that might be different. Uh, and, and at least initially, the, I think the response was that this was seen as a denial of that optimism and a, and a refusal of the change. Mm -hmm. um, when the board, <clears throat> when your contract was re-signed for a year, um, with the ability to terminate you without cause, um, did you kind of see that as some sort of warning? Well, that that the clause of termination without cause was it, that's in every contract. That's not that's not anything new. Uh, that's that's just standard contract language for a position like this. Um, I was um, I understood exactly why the board did what they did. Um, our plans are a threat to the board uh, because we're basically saying we don't want this board governing the University of Oregon and the board didn't want to give up control of the University of Oregon. It's, uh, that, that's not new. It didn't start when I came here. That was, uh, that was a battle that the university has been fighting for 25 years. Um, my uh, I was hired here to get the university out from under the University of Oregon. That was what, that was what I was, that's the reason I took this job. To get the university out from under, the, not the university, but get the university out from under the Oregon University system. Uh, what <coughs> types of stipulations were included in, uh, in the contract signing in June uh, that were different than the, than the original contract that you had done? I uh, there, there were, there were uh, the original contract that they gave me asked me to um, to cease advocating for the new partnership um, and to advocate uh, myself and also to control anyone else who might be interested in these matters to stop them from advocating for anything except what the board wanted. Uh, I said that I wouldn't sign that because it just didn't seem reasonable. That was the real sticking point. We negotiated for quite a long time over that, and they finally agreed to say anything that the board and or the governor would advocate for. And that I agreed to because we had already discussed with the governor where he wanted to go. And it was pretty coincident with what we were interested in. So I, as long as the governor's interests were there, that was okay with me. Um, <clears throat> were you surprised that um, Kit Haber was in support of your termination? Yes. Oh, why so? Pardon? Why so? Uh, because throughout all of this wrestling with the, with the board, he, um, he seemed to be supportive. And how does it make you feel knowing now that he well, it's, I'm disappointed, uh, very disappointed. Um, but these things, you know, there's, there's political stuff going on that someone like me isn't privy to. And, and sometimes you're the beneficiary and sometimes you're the victim. Um, in retrospect, what do you think you could 
could have done to avoid being in this situation? Well, Tyree, I've thought a lot about that. You might be surprised to hear. Uh, sorry about that. Lots of telephone tag going on these days. Um, I'll just re-ask the question for you. Um, what do you think you could have done uh, differently to avoid being in this situation? Um, well, every, uh, every, pretty much every day, I sort of sit back and think, what should I have done differently or better? Um, I, I made a really fundamental mistake uh, in assuming that what we were communicating to the chancellor was being communicated to the board. And I made that mistake right from the get-go because that's the normal way uh, that the, the chancellor is the vector of communication. <clears throat> I'm not sure that that really worked. Um, there were a lot of things that the board didn't know, uh, which I assumed they did, and their policies uh, and their postures around these issues therefore looked like they were really in, in, in opposition to what we were trying to do, but I'm not sure they really understood what we were trying to do, and that's been the case for quite a long time. Um, so I could have communicated with the board a lot better than I did. Did the relationship <laughs> with the board worsen uh, throughout this term? Um, I don't know that it, that it worsened. Uh, yeah, probably it did. Uh, because we simply, we simply had to do, we had to take some extraordinary measures to stop the loss of faculty and and those extraordinary measures were the salary increases that we distributed. People say, oh, well, you gave to the faculty, but you also gave to the uh, administrators. Officers of administration, there are only three categories of employee. There's faculty, officers of administration, and, and uh, uh, classified. And so officers of administration are librarians and lab people, et cetera. Uh, key people to the delivery of services on the education and research side. So it wasn't that we gave increases to fat cat administrators, but to the people who are actually doing the, the work here. And we had to do that. Um, the fact that other universities weren't in a position to be able to afford that caused great discomfort with the board and the chancellor, and that was a pretty key issue for them. And so that made kind of the relationship between you and the board much more difficult to maintain? Yeah. Uh, in October, <clears throat> you made an unusual hire by signing your former co-worker, Robert Birdall, into an administrative advisory position. Uh, can you explain why you thought that was necessary? Yes. Um, the provost, uh, Jim Bean, had stepped down f because of medical reasons. He went on a sabbatical leave. Uh, to try and recover. Uh, he had to lower his stress level, apparently. Um, that left a pretty big gap in the university's administration. Um, Lorraine Davis valiantly and courageously agreed to take that position on an interim basis. Um, there was considerable concern among, among the faculty that she represented the old guard and the old view of things, and would do we still have the kind of vision and forward-looking uh, imagination that we that we had Jim Bean and I had put forth previously? And while I had great confidence in Lorraine, I felt that it would be beneficial to have Bob Berdall's experience as Chancellor at Berkeley, President at Texas, head of the AAU, to come in and just look and see where we are as an institution and where we need to go. And so we brought him in as kind of reinforcements on a temporary basis. When was the first time you made uh, contact with Bertal? Uh, it was at the Pendleton Roundup. Uh, I, he wasn't there. I was there. I was at the Pendleton Roundup. And this idea just popped into my head. I was actually sit sitting on the front porch of the bed and breakfast we were staying in in Pendleton. And I, th I thought, 
why don't I just see if he's interested? So I, I literally stepped off the porch onto the sidewalk and gave him a call, um, and, and he was interested. I mean, we didn't finalize any deal at that point, but he said he was interested, and I was delighted. The university received some um, maybe criticism for uh, the salary that uh, he received for his part-time work. Um, well, why, would you, why do you feel that was necessary to uh, compensate him at, uh, I think it was $96,000? Um, yes, that's for, uh, for a 40% time appointment. Um, for someone with his experience, his level of expertise, his, uh, his market value, as it were, um, we had to pay uh, an amount commensurate with his, with his skill set, with his unique uh, skill set. Uh, actually, this is a pretty low uh, price for someone to work that much time, uh, and he's doing it at that quite low price because he really has affection for the university. Um, someone of Bob's expertise is uh, probably, you know, in the six to seven hundred thousand dollar level uh, at this point in his career per year. So if we've got him for forty percent for under a hundred grand, that's pretty. That's a pretty good deal. Looks like a big number to, to a lot of people, uh, and it is a big number. But it's because he's a unique. Uh, individual. Uh, did his hiring have anything to do with your relationship with the OUS? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, I have no idea what their response was to that. It's not something that ever came up. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences unanimously announced that they were in support of Robert uh, Bertall serving as an interim president. Um, who do you think would be the best candidate uh, as an interim president? I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on that. Okay. Uh, why do you feel that uh, the College of Arts and Sciences is uh, supporting uh, for it all? In this sense? Well, because of his uh, credentials and experience and stature in the academic world. I mean, he's, to be the president of the American Association of Universities is is to be the president of the organization that represents the top 62 research institutions in America. And so I mean, he's seen it all. Uh, he recently wrote, um, and by recently I mean uh, just two days ago, he wrote uh, an op-ed in the Register Guard uh, criticizing uh, the OUS, uh, OUS's removal of, of the U.S. president. Um, do you feel that that is going to have impact on his ability to get uh, a position as an interim? I, I don't, th I'm not in a position to comment on what the OUS might or might not do. Okay. And um, kind of to kind of summarize things, what do you think the university and the OUS need to do to uh, restore trust? Um, that's a good question. Uh, my understanding is that now the position of the OUS is that there really is no policy distinct, uh, differentiation between what we want here on this campus and what the OUS wants as the ultimate outcome. Um, if that's the case, that would be a really good way to reestablish trust. Okay. Uh, and um, you don't need to mention any names here, but what type of a president would you like to see uh, come in in your, in your place? Well, someone who deeply cares about the place, uh, who has a passion for public higher education, uh, who wants to really deeply engage the challenges that are unique to this place, um, challenges around affordability, challenges around diversity, challenges around um, freeing the university from the position of subsidy to the other universities in the system so that we can focus all of our revenues on making the University of Oregon the best place it can be for the state of Oregon. Somebody who understands that and is deeply committed to it, uh, I think would be great. And what, um, 
in what way do you think the president should manage their relations with, with the OUS? What steps do you think they will need to take? Well, it's my sincere hope that the president won't have any relationship with the OUS, that, there, that we will have a publicly appointed board that's sole purpose is to guide this institution and to see that this institution's public mission is fulfilled. Uh, what will you miss most about being uh, the president of the University of Oregon? How much time have you got? <laughs> Give us a list. Um, I will miss the opportunity to interact with students um, in the way that, that I've been able to. I'll miss um, being able to uh, help faculty get past uh, bureaucratic and other challenges that they face to do their work in a way that only a president can do to streamline things. Um, and I'll miss interaction with the alumni community. It's really a spectacular group of people. Uh, 180,000 people out there that just love this place and are hungry for an opportunity to participate in its life and to give back because when we're students, we don't understand what a unique opportunity we're, we're presented with. And after you've been out around uh, in, in the world for a few, a few cycles, you begin to understand what a great place this really was and for you and, and watching that, dealing with that is really terrific reinforces your energy and your commitment to the place. I'll miss that.